possess my mind and body. Sitting out by Henry's pool one day, chain smoking pot, drinking beer, talking about what we're gonna do. He tells me about a place called uh, Pahoa, TV show for stoners, good market for it right now. And uh, the name Dave High, the name High there, popped out of my mouth almost before it even entered my head. I describe it as possessed by the evil spirit of Dave High. He created himself. It was, uh, what, what do you call that? Uh, spontaneous combustion. Rolling joints. Interesting. Um, yeah, Wayne came up with that during our little uh, creation of High there at the table. There were several names thrown out. Uh, James Bong was one, but uh, Rolling Joints kind of stuck. Day of High is uh, my take on myself at my worst, at worst times. I satirize myself and I make fun of myself in it with that character. And to a degree, it's uh, somewhat confessional, not something I'm proud of. It's me at my worst. Uh, if I was like that all the time, I don't think I'd be alive. But there's no denying that I've been like that many times in my life. I'm very sensitive, especially to pot smoke. I get second-handed very easily. So I came up with the, the gas mask idea because, you know, back in the riot days of Los Angeles, tear gas was plentiful, so I have a tear gas mask. And I decided, let's give it a try, and it worked really well. I got my start at the Sydney Daily Mirror, a Rupert Murdoch paper. I was just a kid, I was 18, straight out of high school, couldn't get a job. Just lucky meeting, got an interview, started as a copy boy. I started writing stories, they liked them, and got me a trip to New York, working for uh, Murdoch's uh, fledgling empire. Before you knew it, I had a career. It was a long-running tabloid career. I happened to find something I was good at. When I got out of film school, I came knocking in Hollywood and became a film runner for a film production company and was promoted to a film apprentice editor, but I really wanted to do camera work. So I went back to school and got interested in journalism and became a news cameraman for several stations out of Hollywood in Los Angeles and worked for a few networks. I met Wayne going back probably 13, 14 years at uh, KCOP, um, Channel 13 in Hollywood. Uh, I was uh, assigned to the investigative group and was thrown together with Wayne and we went back east working on a UFO story. We went over there with the idea of doing a TV show for stoners, going to the best places in the world to get high. And uh, our attitude was, let's just go and see what we find. It ended up, you know, what I, we like to call the making of a TV show that never gets made. There was no research. Henry had told me about this place called Pahoa, a kind of community of old and younger hippies, dropouts. Uh, a lot of pot, a lot of partying, uh, a nice uh, tropical island. It sounded pretty good to me. All I'd seen of Hawaii previously was uh, Honolulu on a brief stop on the way to Australia. And I was even disappointed with that. That was nothing compared to how disappointed I was with Pahoa. The place, like I say, and it was like a wild west town. There's, young hippies, old hippies, drug addicts, alcoholics. Uh, it was uh, a town of dropouts. I, I expected palm trees, maybe some huts, you know, that romantic vision of Hawaii. And uh, this, this far from heaven, it looked a, a little bit more like hell to me. I'm totally into the uh, hybrid gonzo. I mean, it's in your face and you, you, sometimes you're part of the story. And once we were comfortable in our environment and we had the local townsfolk accepting us, not thinking we were federal agents, drug agents, um, it was just natural. Yeah, once they realized we weren't going to take their drugs off them, but they had a better chance of getting drugs off us, we were in. Yeah. <laughs> so I chose a, a camera that was about the size of an Apple iPhone called the Kodak ZI8 that provided nice footage and was very compact and the local people were comfortable with that because when I had the usual camera, they were very apprehensive and they were camera shy. 
We never used any hidden cameras during the production of High there. They were um, all either the ZIA camera or the Sony Super HD camera, the Super 35. It was so discreet and small that right. people just forgot they were even there. And you, you got them as they were. They weren't hamming it up or, uh, or, 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 or trying to be actors. We brought the full complement of uh, you know film production, the, the big cameras, the big tripods, you know, some lighting. But you know, we, we wanted to capture the, the story in a real um, natural sense. And we weren't uh, able to accomplish that with the conventional equipment. It just wasn't going to happen. The few things we did know as we were going in was uh, the place had a nude beach, had a lot of pot, good, very good pot, had a lot of hippies smoking it, it had Roseanne Barr, a celebrity, so it had a lot of elements that at least uh, gave us a bit of a head start. What we didn't figure on was uh, Roger Christie. I had no idea of that story until we went in there. Uh, so that was the surprise package. and. That became pivotal in the film. Uh, that was when things got terribly serious and terribly scary. Roger Christie, I found fascinating, was a former military intelligence guy who became a kind of a pot legalization guru, a figurehead, especially in Hawaii. He started up the THC church, the marijuana church, where it was considered a holy sacrament. What's remarkable about, about this is uh, it operated for 10 years. The officials, the government, local government officials loved him. It was helping the community, it wasn't causing any trouble. 10 years, no problem. They loved it. I think he was helping the economy. Uh, then all of a sudden, uh, the feds decide to bust him. They arrest him uh, and about a dozen other followers. The other ones, I think, got out or you know, got sentenced or whatever. But Roger uh, is slammed away in a federal detention center in Honolulu uh, without formal charges, without a trial for three years. And his wife, Cher, came to me hoping that I could get some media attention on this case and help get Roger some justice. At least a trial, hopefully, to get him out of that hellhole that he was in. So that's what we did. Um, the story was amazing. Um, it, it made our film go into overdrive. Wayne made his phone call to his contacts in New York and uh, we, we brought the story to the mainland and uh, exposed it. The film made its premiere at a film festival in Los Angeles on August 20, 2014. And literally within days, uh, Roger Christie was a free man. It just shows you the power of the media. It also shows you how pathetic the media is because <laughs> they let the poor bastard sit there for nearly four years and no one touched the story. So a couple of dickheads like us go in there we do the story and all of a sudden uh, he's out. Shit, man, you know, I, I, I'm drunk and stoned, the whole thing. We, we did a better job than uh, the freaking New York Times and any other of these dead shit assholes that can't get out of their own way and are too gutless to take on a story like that. It's pathetic. It makes me sick. Uh, you know, this is, this is about uh, the American Constitution, freedom and your rights. Yeah, it's a, it's a comedy, you know, I, I, I choose to laugh, but my reaction would be like a lot of people, horror, I don't know if it's a horror movie or a comedy, but I had to laugh at it, I hope people laugh at it, I hope they laugh at me, I, I don't mind, it kind of gives you license to laugh at everybody else.